Anyone who's ever debated creation versus evolution has almost certainly encountered the incredulity of the evolutionist when it comes to the topic of Noah's Flood. While some evolutionists might concede that perhaps there was at some point in the past a very significant flood event due to the fact that so many ancient writings and oral traditions around the world refer to one, they almost inevitably insist that such an event would have had to have been merely some kind of localized occurrence, regardless of how cataclysmic it may have felt to the people at the time. Why do evolutionists have such a difficult time entertaining the possibility of Noah's flood? When we look at the biblical text, it becomes fairly easy to see. In Genesis 7, starting in verse 11, it reads, In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened, and rain fell on the earth forty days and forty nights. On that very day Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, together with his wife and the wives of their three sons, entered the ark. They had with them every kind of wild animal according to its kind, all livestock according to their kinds, every creature that moves along the ground according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, everything with wings. Pairs of all creatures that have breath of life in them came to Noah and entered the ark. The animals going in were male and female of every living thing, as God had commanded Noah, then the Lord shut him in. For forty days the flood kept coming on the earth. As the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth, and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than fifteen cubits. Every living thing that moved on land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swarm over the earth, and all mankind. Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals, and the creatures that move along the ground, and the birds were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left, and those with him on the ark. The waters flooded the earth for 150 days. Now, believers in evolution and its assertions that the earth took billions of years to form, with its various stages and ice ages and everything, understandably scoffed the idea that water could have filled the entire earth and that it could have been covered with water for 150 days, especially to the degree that it covered the highest mountains on earth, surpassing them by 15 cubits, which is apparently roughly 20 feet. But if one holds to the Bible as the authoritative word of God, as a reliable and accurate account, then this is precisely what must be upheld if one wishes to hold to a position of literal, biblical interpretation, and not start sliding down the slippery slope of trying to make the text conform itself to our own modern assumptions about what is and isn't possible. Now, the reason I bring all this up is because I was thinking about this recently, and I started to ask myself just how much water it would have actually required to completely cover the, the whole earth over the tops of the highest mountains. After a little googling and some basic multiplication, this is what I came up with. According to the current models of the alleged globe, the surface area of the Earth is around 510 million square kilometers. Everyone knows that the highest mountain peak on Earth is Mount Everest, and if that is indeed the case, then its elevation is purported to be 8.848 kilometers, almost 8.5 kilometers above sea level. So when, when we multiply the two, we get the figure of 4,512,480,000 cubic kilometers. That's how much water it would require to cover the top of Mount Everest. And that's if we were talking about how much water would be needed in addition to the amount of water already present in the oceans, lakes, and rivers in the world today. Now, I, I do recognize that this is a pretty crude calculation because it's not accounting for the amount of dry land that is above sea level, which would be cutting into the amount of that required volume. However, it's also not accounting for the fact that in a globe model, such a calculation shouldn't be made in a way that assumes a rectilinear volume, because obviously the surface area of the, the top of the floodwaters would be greater than the surface area of the original sea level or sea level today. But So there would actually it would actually require slightly more water than this calculation even implies. So that being said, I'm, I'm basically letting these two factors cancel each other out, since the whole point here is really just to get a ballpark idea of how much how much water we'd really be talking about anyways. Because here's the kicker. According to the USGS, if we believe their statistics, the total amount of water, both including saltwater, freshwater, in the entire Earth, amounts to somewhere around 
386 million cubic kilometers. Now, assuming that the topography of the Earth was generally similar both before and after the flood, and that's a big assumption, I admit, then the total waters of the Great Flood would have been the present day 1.386 billion cubic kilometers plus the 4.5 billion cubic kilometers, bringing it to a total of 5.886 billion cubic kilometers. But the bottom line is, if we are talking about a difference of 4.5 billion cubic kilometers of water from the current amount that is on above and below the surface of the Earth, then the glaring question arises, where did all that water come from? And where did it all go afterwards? I mean, we're talking about a total difference of about 4.2 times the amount of all the water supposedly on the Earth right now. And that is a lot of liquid. Now, for some time, many advocates of biblical creationism proposed the so-called canopy theory in an attempt to explain this. The idea was that the floodwaters were being held in a canopy of water vapor above the Earth, and so this would have meant that there were radically different atmospheric conditions between pre-flood and post-flood eras, as well as giving some effort in, into explaining the verses in Genesis which speak of the waters above the firmament, and so on. However, many creationist organizations and teachers have been shying away from the canopy model in recent years for pretty understandable reasons. First and foremost, it just doesn't give you nearly enough water. As we have seen, the amount of water required in liquid form to cover the tops of the highest mountains is a phenomenal, mind-numbing amount. For that much water to have been up in the atmosphere in gaseous form would provide a whole host of other problems to your model. I mean, would sunlight even be able to get through at all? Would it even be able to stay in a gas form if being pushed that far out into the upper edges of the atmosphere and not turn into ice from the cold? Not only this, but I've even read an article from Answers in Genesis, which is a pretty well-known creationist organization, where they're, where they're explaining why they've moved away from the canopy model. And they mentioned that it also <laughs> proved problematic because if the waters above the firmament were actually this whole water vapor can canopy idea, then it would mean that the sun, moon, and stars were inside the atmosphere. <laughs> which, of, of course, I can't help but see the irony there. Because truly, when you allow your, yourself to stop and take a step back and re-examine the same model of the Earth and the cosmos that was held by the very same individuals who wrote Genesis and the other books of the Bible, you suddenly no longer have any of those problems which inevitably arise when trying to conform the Bible and accounts such as that of the Great Flood to the heliocentric Copernican model. Beyond this, even if we were to grant the possibility of the floodwaters coming from a vapor canopy above the globe, this is... This still wouldn't explain the simple question as to where all that water went as the floodwaters receded. Because even ad advocates of the canopy theory have to concede that the canopy is no longer present. Did all that water, and remember we're talking 4.8 billion cubic kilometers more than the 1.86 we can supposedly account for on the Earth today, did all that somehow seep into the bowels of the spinning globe Earth? To try and argue such a thing would mean to have to stand in opposition to the very same geological models of the Earth's structure which the Copernican model asserts is established fact. You have to start assuming the existence of massive fissures and caverns in the Earth's oceanic and continental crust, which overall is another interesting example of, of the problems which, which rise up when trying to simultaneously conform the, the biblical model to the models provided by modern scientism but then yet also disregard them whenever you need to force something to fit. How does such an approach know, know when to accept the official data and when to dismiss it? However, if the firmament isn't some confusingly convoluted concept of the sky and or the atmosphere and or outer space, but instead some kind of literal dome above our heads, then yeah, the waters above the firmament could be a, such a vast quantity that our tiny human brains couldn't even fathom it. We're no longer having to ignore or allegorize such verses such as the ones that speak of the floodgates or the windows of heaven, nor the ones that speak of the fountains of the deep. It really is the only way to honestly render a literal interpretation of what Genesis has been plainly saying for thousands of years. And so, it's, I guess it's not difficult to understand why so many people, even those 
professing to hold to a literal interpretation of the Bible, would have such a difficult time accepting the idea that the globe model is false. Not only are there the intellectual obstacles of accepting the massive deception required to perpetrate things like fake moon landings and the Mars rover and the ISS and everything, but it affects so many things which we assume to understand about not just the, the heavens or outer space, quote unquote, but about our own atmosphere and the subterranean world and even things as fundamental as the water cycle.